Good afternoon, brethren. Please take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 11. Take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 11. And look at verse number 2. Luke chapter 11 and verse number 2. This sermon will be the conclusion of the End Times series. I don't know about you, but I've really enjoyed preparing the sermons, uh, preaching it. Um, I've learned a lot just uh, in my own personal study as I was going through this. Um, some things I've included that I learned in the sermons and some things I've kept for a later date. Um, but yeah, I, I hope it's been a, a benefit to you. But if you look at Luke chapter 11 and verse number 2, these are the words of Jesus as he was teaching his disciples to pray. He prayed and he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done as in heaven, so in earth. And I want you to notice that Jesus Christ is praying to the Father, his heavenly Father, and he's asking, Thy kingdom come. He's asking for the kingdom of God to come on this earth. And so the title for the sermon this afternoon is The Coming Kingdom of God. The Coming Kingdom of God. Now, uh, you, if you can go to Luke chapter 13 now, go to Luke 13. I'm going to read to you from Colossians chapter 1 verse 13. But you go to Luke 13. And um, if you want some in-depth teaching on the kingdom of God, and, uh, you know, I, I would turn your attention toward, uh, I preached a sermon called, What is the Kingdom of God? It was, it was during, uh, I can't remember which, which chapter of Luke that I preached it through, but if you look at the, the series of the playlist in the book of Luke, there's a sermon called, What is the Kingdom of God? And I go into a lot more depth, and I just want to give you a quick summary of the Kingdom of God here. But if I read Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, the Bible reads, Who have delivered us from the power of darkness... Hey, that's a saved person. That's someone who has placed their faith on Jesus Christ. We've been delivered from the power of darkness. But then it says this, and have translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. You see, if you are saved, you have been translated. You have entered already in a spiritual sense. You've entered into the kingdom of God. You know, when Jesus Christ came, uh, uh, sorry, when Nicodemus came to Jesus in John chapter 3, Jesus said, you know, you won't be able to see or enter the kingdom of God unless you are born again. And so that moment that you're born again, the, the new man is, is brought to life, you're saved. Spiritually speaking, that new man lives in the kingdom of God. Not this old flesh, but the new man. The spiritual man in you lives in that kingdom of God. And what I taught in that sermon, what is the kingdom of God, is that there are three phases to this one kingdom. Right now there is a spiritual phase uh, that you know, anybody would go and preach the gospel to. If they get saved, they enter into that kingdom. We don't see it with our physical eyes. We can't touch it. But it's a spiritual kingdom. But then this kingdom will develop. And when Christ comes back, when he establishes his millennial reign, he reigns for a thousand years. That's the second phase of this kingdom. When Christ comes, and then at the end of the thousand years, the kingdom, Christ will give it unto the Father. We'll have a look at some passages later. And that new heavens and new earth is that final phase of the kingdom of God. And so we saw Jesus Christ uh, praying, desiring for God's kingdom to be on the earth. That, that His will will be done in heaven, or as so in, in, in earth. Uh, that His will be on this earth as it is in heaven, I should say. And if you go to Luke 13, look at verse 28, please. Luke 13, verse 28. So I just want to show you this. So we have the kingdom now, okay, when you're saved. But then Jesus Christ spoke of Luke 13, 28. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. See, Jesus Christ is telling the Christ-rejecting Jews at this point in time that you are going to be cast out of the kingdom. You won't be able to enter in, but others from the east, the west, the north, and the south, the Gentiles from all the world will be able to enter into the kingdom of God and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so you see, even though in a sense, yes, we are in the kingdom of God, spiritually speaking, but there is a coming, literal, physical kingdom that we're going to be gathered together with the saints throughout all generations and we're going to be able to fellowship together, rejoicing and enjoying the kingdom of God. Now, if you can now turn to the book of Revelation, 
Actually, I might get you to turn to 2 Peter. Go to 2 Peter chapter 3. Go to 2 Peter chapter 3 for me. And the, in the last sermon on the series, I was speaking about the wrath of God. And I was just giving you a, a taste, a flavor for what the wrath of God will look like. Of course, I mean, I could have turned that, that sermon, just, just the sermons on, the, on God's wrath into multiple series, just, that, just on the wrath of God alone. But when we look at the seven vials, if you may recall, the seventh vial is the final judgment that God uh, pours out on Mystery Babylon the Great. Okay? Now, I'm going to read to you from Revelation 16, verse 19, but you go to 2 Peter chapter 3. And I, want to, I just want to read this portion to you when Babylon is judged. In Revelation 16, verse 19, it reads, And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. But then notice the next words. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. You see, while God is pouring out his wrath on the earth, there comes a time when every island disappears. Every mountain is not found. I mean, God's wrath has dramatic consequences on the geography and the topology of the earth. You know, I, I, the way I understand that is these islands, these, these small islands in the, in the Pacific and in other places, will be completely uh, covered by water, you know. And, and these mountains, by the, all the earthquakes, by the disaster that's going on, the fires, the hail, they're just going to be wiped out. Okay, the, the earth will be leveled, so you, we won't be able to see uh, at, at the end of God's wrath, as we enter into the millennial reign of Christ, the, 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 com, you know, the geography of the earth has changed completely. You won't be able to recognize Mount Everest. You won't be able to see those mountains that you've known about in the past. You won't be able to find those islands that you may have holiday, holiday to. They're not there anymore. Okay? And so my point is there's, there's significant changes after the wrath of God. And then in verse 21 it says... And there shall fall, so and there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. So, great hail, I mean, just destruction from God as He pours out His wrath. It completely changes again the geography and topology of the earth. Now, you're in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 10. Have a look at the words here. The Bible reads, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Now, you may recall what the day of the Lord is. I've covered that I mean, just in the last sermon. What was it? It's the day. It's the same day as the day of Christ. It's the day that Christ will come and, and, and um, you know, gather his saints unto himself. But then on that same day, half an hour of silence takes place. Then God begins to pour out his wrath. Okay, so this is the day of the Lord, the day of God's wrath. And notice what happens on the day of the Lord. I'll read it again, verse number 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Notice that, fervent heat. And the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So it's quite clear what's happening here on the day of the Lord. Fire, destruction of fire upon the earth. And um, I've heard a lot of teaching on 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. Most people believe, like most preachers, believe that this is speaking about uh, Christ destroying the first earth in a sense and bringing in the new heavens and the new earth. But keep in mind, there's still a thousand years where Christ will rule and reign. And also keep in mind that you know what the day of the Lord is. It's actually quite clear, right? The day of the Lord is that first day when God begins to pour out his wrath. So is this really about God totally destroying the earth to bring in a new heaven and new earth? No, no, it's talking about the elements of the earth being burnt up, okay? And again, this ties in with God's wrath. On that, on that first day when God begins to pour out His wrath, let's keep reading verse number 11. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? But, and, and for us, so we know that this earth is going to be wiped out, it's going to be burnt up. But look at verse number 12. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Okay, again, so we see the heat, we see the fire burning up the earth. You say, well, that, that, that's got to be 
where God just ultimately destroys this old earth and creates a new earth. But I want you to just keep in mind there again, you know, it's very clear that God will use fire on the day of the Lord, that God will bring about, you know, fervent heat on this day. And of course, if you recall, I'll read to you Revelation chapter 8, verse 5. On the very first day, on the day of, of, uh, of the Lord, when, when uh, the, first tr- uh, tr- the first angel begins to blow his trump, I'll just read a portion to you if you recall. Revelation chapter 8, verse 5, it says, And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar, remember that? And cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. So this takes place on the day of the Lord. This takes place half an hour after the rapture where this sensor in heaven is filled up with fire by this angel and it's cast down onto the earth. You know, God's casting down fire onto the earth. Well, this would line up with the day of the Lord with things burning up with a fervent heat, does it not? And then in verse number six, and the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded. Now remember what was the first angel? And there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. And they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees was burnt up, and all the green grass was burnt up. Now, uh, for the brethren, you know, you Australians, during the bushfires, right, we had these bushfires, how hot were those days? Now, I know we were experiencing summer as well, but obviously the fires were playing an, an, an effect on weather conditions. And man, some of those months, some of those days was stinking hot, wasn't it? while the fires were burning. Well, what about if one third of all the, fire, all the trees of the earth are, are on fire? What if every grass all over the world is on fire? Well, that's what takes place on the day of the Lord. You know, the entire earth is burning up with a fervent heat. You know, and when God's done pouring out his wrath, the earth's not going to look the same. The mountains are gone. The, the islands have been covered by, by water. They, they're gone. Okay, I mean, there's, there's, there's uh, great earthquakes that take place during that time. And so uh, we see the earth being destroyed because of God's wrath. But of course, it, there's, you know, it's more than a day. You know, it goes on for that, the rest of that seven-year period. And the reason I say that to you is because you should still be in 2 Peter chapter 1. Uh, sorry, 2 Peter chapter 3. And look at verse number 13. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. Nevertheless, we, according to His promise... Look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. So should we be sad that this earth that we know, that all the great mountains that we we look at and and, and have some awe about, should we be upset that it's all destroyed, that it all tumbles down? No, because we should be looking for the new heaven, the new earth that God will create in the future. And that, of course, makes up the coming kingdom of God. Now, before I get into the, into the kingdom of God and why this is important, why is it important for, God to, for Christ to come and rule for a thousand years and then for God to create a new heavens and a new earth? Why is this important? Well, if you can now take your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. And we're going to look at the fall of man once again. Um, and you say, why do we always go back to Genesis 3? It's because this is where it all starts. I mean, you know, where man has sinned against the Lord and the Lord curses man and woman and the serpent and the earth. I mean, everything in the Bible ultimately points back to this time, you know. And uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 17, after Adam, you know, is confronted by God for what he did and, and God curses the, the serpent and curses, or, you know, Eve, he brings the curse down on Adam as well in verse number 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Look, notice the next words. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, thou, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for thus thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So notice the curse that God has put upon Adam uh, for sinning against him, for taking of that fruit. He says, not only was Adam cursed, but he says that the ground is cursed. You see, the earth was cursed. And because of this, thorns and thistles will be brought forth. So instead of you gardening 
and, and you know, having perfect plants, you're going to have some difficulties. There are going to be thorns and thistles that grow out of your garden. You know why? Because there's, like, there's actually a curse on this earth. Not only was the earth cursed, but we saw that obviously Adam will have to work hard to provide for his needs. But the, at the end of verse number 19, at right at the end, it said, For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. You see, before this event, Adam and Eve could live forever. You know, they, they could never die. There, there was no sin which brought forth death. But because this judgment came from God, this curse fell upon, uh, upon Adam, he was now destined not just to die spiritually, which he did, but he was destined to die physically. He was destined to die. So those are the two major changes. A curse on the earth and death. Okay, and death. A physical death. So that's, that's the curse that God's brought upon the earth when Adam and Eve sinned back in the Garden of Eden. But there was a second curse that fell upon the earth. And if you can now go to Genesis chapter 8, Genesis chapter 8 and verse 21. Genesis chapter 8, and we're looking at the flood, of course. And, uh, you know, Noah builds the ark, brings his family onto the ark, and then uh, once things have settled, they come off the ark. God makes a new covenant with, with Noah, etc. And then he says these words God does in Acts, uh, sorry, Genesis chapter 8, verse 21, which says, And the Lord smelt a sweet savor, so Noah offered a sacrifice. And the Lord said in his heart, notice the next words, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. Now, I think some people have read this and understood it as though God cursed the ground when Adam sinned, but now he was lifting that curse from Adam. From, from Adam. The, the, the ground was no longer cursed. That's not what it's referring to. When it refers to, I will not again curse the ground, he's just finished about what happened. The, the flood. Okay, he destroyed the earth. He destroyed all living creatures except what was on the ark. And I guess the only exceptions to that were the marine animals that would live in the ocean and the insects. But that was God's curse on the earth. God's curse fell in, 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 as a flood, you know, with these, these waters drowning out, you know, mankind. I mean, just think about the anger of God there. Think about God's wrath there. And then once he has accomplished that, he says, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. The context of that would be the flood. He's not going to flood the earth again, okay? Destroy the earth in that sense. We see later on God destroys the earth with fire, but, you know, he's not going to do it with a flood. And then he says, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. So that's what he's referring to, that smiting every living thing with the flood. Verse number 22, while the earth remaineth, sea time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. So what are some of the results of this curse, of this flood that came upon the earth? What are some of the results of that? Just look at the next chapter, Genesis 9, verse number 1, just continue on. It says here, And God blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth. Notice the next words, And the fear of you... And the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand are they delivered. So one change that happened now is that the animals will be fearful or dread man. Okay? There would be a fear um, of, of, of mankind. Okay? So before the flood, there was no such dread of animals. There was no such fear. You know, you could walk up to any animal, they won't flee from you. You know, you, it was obviously easier to domesticate animals, you know, to have, I mean, you didn't have to, that, 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 that would have been tame to man. You know, you could have had any kind of variety of animals as your pets, you know, any kind of wild animal. And uh, after the flood, though, God brought in a fear, you know, into the living creatures. Notice number, verse number three. Every moon thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. So before the flood, humans were vegetarians. All the animals were, were vegetarians. But after the flood, God commanded Noah to eat of every animal. You know, and this is, again, where you get carniver carnivorous animals as well. You know, hunt, le learning to adapt to hunt for their prey 
And so this was a, a, a change because of this second curse that God brought upon the earth with a flood. The changes were that animals will fear man and that we would be able to eat meat. Okay, so these things were not in place prior to the flood. This was something that happened after the flood. So you can see this double whammy effect. You know, when Adam and Eve sinned, there was a curse on the earth. And then when Noah's flood took place, there was another curse which had uh, lasting effects onto how uh, humans interact with animals. And even how animals interact with one another. And so we're at a state where we have almost like this double curse on the earth. Okay? And so when we look, about, uh, when we look at, when we consider a regeneration of the earth, you know, of God having to bring things back the way he intended, he would have to remove that double whammy of the curse as well. And the first stage of that is the millennium, okay? And then the next stage to remove all of it is the new heaven and the new earth, okay? Now, I'll just, if you can go to Isaiah, please turn to Isaiah 65. Isaiah 65. When we look at the millennium in the book of Revelation, uh, we get, what is it, seven verses, roughly, of, the, of the, what the millennium is like. You know, basically speaking about the, the devil being bound in the bottomless pit, uh, for a thousand years, about Christ ruling and reigning on this earth, and believers ruling with Christ, and that's about it. That's, all, that's about all that you get. So actually, in the book of Isaiah, especially Isaiah 65 and Isaiah 66, we get a lot more detail on the events of the new heavens and the new earth, um, and even the millennium. You know, these two things, uh, we get a lot, lot more information in these two chapters. But look at Isaiah 65 and verse 20. Isaiah 65 and verse 20. And this is about the millennium. So after this earth is destroyed by the wrath of God, after Christ comes back and establishes the millennium, you know, this is what it's going to be like in verse number 20. It says, There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die an hundred years old, but the sinner, being an hundred years old, shall be accursed. Okay? So it's saying here, if someone dies... A hundred years old. I mean, think, think about that. If someone dies a hundred years old now, we'd think, oh, wow, he lived a full life. Wouldn't we say that? But in the millennium, when people live to be, if they, if they live to a hundred years old and they die at a hundred, then uh, it says here that it's, it's like they're a child. You know, it's like they're, they're a little child that died. They did not see out all the days of their life. So we see this significant change that takes place. And it said there that uh, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. So an old man will see out his time. And, you know, this takes us back to the pre-flood world when men lived to be, you know, some 900, almost 1,000 years old. You know, many men you can read about before the flood, just read it yourself, lived for hundreds and hundreds of years. And so when we enter into that millennium, you know, we see a, a lifting of that curse. That curse uh, before the flood is lifted and men can now live these long period of times. I mean, what, what a blessing for people in this time to, to live that long. Now, you might say, well, how about us, Pastor Kevin? Are we going to live for 900 years? You know, well, here's the thing. In the millennium, you're going to have your new resurrected bodies already. You know, you're, you're not going to have this corrupted sinful flesh. You're going to have the new resurrected body that reflects Jesus Christ. So you'll never die. I mean, you, you have even better than living 900 years or so, right? You will never die in your new resurrected body bodies but you can see how there's an element of that curse being lifted because after the flood people did not live to be anywhere near 900 800 700 years but it's coming back in the future it's coming back in the millennium it also said there in verse number 20 it said but the sinner being 100 years old shall be accursed so what else do we notice about the millennium is sin completely gone no there's there are still sinners that live during this time. Again, because these people live in these long period of times, they're still living in the old sinful flesh, the ones that we have today. But God has expanded it to live in a much long, for a much longer period of time. And of course, the reason, you know, you know this is the whole reason that Christ has to reign for a thousand years, okay? It's because there is still sin, Okay, there is still sin on this earth. And I, I can just, I'll read some passages. To, actually, maybe you want to turn there. Turn to Revelation. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 5. I should, I should have told you to keep a finger in Isaiah. I've got so many passages here. Uh, but if you want, you can go to Revelation chapter 12 and verse number 5. 
And again, this is a, uh, a, a vision of Jesus Christ and his birth and his, his ascension to heaven. But then it's, it says in Revelation 12, 5, And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. So you see this child, of course, referring to Christ's birth. He's been born. He's coming to this world. And he's going to come back to this world to rule with a rod of iron. Why would he need to rule with a rod of iron? Because there are still sinners. You know, during the millennium, there is still sin. There is still crime, you know. And instead of having the uh, corrupted governments that we have today, hey, we're going to have a perfect government. We're going to have Christ as the head of that government. And believers, we're going to be able to rule and reign with Christ. We're going to be particip participate. Maybe you maybe never said, I, have, I, I don't have any interest in politics. Well, don't worry about it. In the millennium, you'll have plenty of time to get into politics. Okay? You'll, be, you'll be ruling and reigning and judging uh, for Christ you know, across the entire world in different capacities. Okay? So there is still sin in this time. I want you to understand in the, in the millennium to come. And then it says there, uh, if, you look, if you look at Revelation chapter 2 now, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 26, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 26, a lot of us understand that Christ is coming to rule with a rod of iron, but a lot of us haven't actually understood that believers will actually rule with rod of iron as well, okay? Revelation chapter 2 verse 26, it says, He that overcometh, now who is someone that overcomes? Someone that is saved. He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Wow, are we going to have power over nations? Yes. Look at this, verse number 27. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father. So Jesus is saying, look, even as I have been given the authority to rule with a rod of iron, I'm going to give that to you as well. You know, so we can rule with Christ during that millennium. Well, what an amazing thing. I mean, I, I can't even process the thought, you know, of the millennium and, and being able to rule in a perfect government, you know, perfect system where someone commits sin, hey, they're going to be judged. Someone commits a crime, hey, yeah, if it's a crime unto death, they're going to be put to death. We saw that the sinner there could live for a hundred years or so, but they'll still be a curse. They're still going to be judged, you know. And if a sinner does not believe on Christ, yes, Christ is walking the earth, but if they don't receive him, they don't receive his sacrifice, hey, they're going to die, and go to hell in, in the same sense that people die and go to hell today and if you can finally go to revelation chapter 20 and verse number six revelation chapter 20 and verse number six just to tie in these thoughts together revelation chapter 20 and verse number six the bible reads blessed and holy is he that have part in the first resurrection what was the first resurrection it's the rapture Okay, if you remember that, the rapture is the first resurrection. And of course, if you're a believer today, you will be a partaker of that first resurrection. You are blessed and holy. Hey, what a great thing. Okay, so we're, again, we're not going to be living in, this, in those old bodies. We're not going to worry about having to live for 900 years because we're going to live forever. But then it says, on such, the second death have no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Wow. Reigning with Christ for a thousand years. I don't know. Do you give it much thought, brethren? You know, I mean, the Bible's full of this. F full of the fact that we're going to rule. We're going to have this rod of iron. We're going to be part of this, this uh, perfect government under Christ. And we're going to be judging the world. I mean, we're finally going to see what true righteous government looks like on this earth, you know. Now, I should have got you to stay in Isaiah. I hope you kept one finger there. So if you can go back to Isaiah 65, go back to Isaiah 65. What else changes in the millennium? How else is this curse lifted? Isaiah 65, verse 25. Isaiah 65 and verse 25. Now, what did we notice about the, the curse after the flood? That there was dread of animals toward men, that we would be able to eat meat. You know, that animals would adapt, you know, carnivorous, carnivorous animals adapt to hunting, uh, you know, their prey. But notice Isaiah 65 and verse 25, the Bible reads, The wolf and the lamb. Oh man, the wolf's going to be destroying the lamb. Well, hold on. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock. Hey, even the lion's going to eat grass. You know, it's going to eat just like a cow. And dust shall be the serpent's meat. 
They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. So you can see the wolf and the lion and the serpent here mentioned. They've got no desire to kill or eat their prey. They're not going to be carnivorous anymore. That, that's lifted. That, that, came, that was brought into place during the flood as the effects of the flood. But that curse will be lifted okay, during the millennium. And now, if you can also go to Isaiah 11, please. Isaiah chapter 11. We see this repeated a, a little bit differently now. Isaiah chapter 11, verse number 6. It says, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. Now notice the next words. And a little child shall lead them. Okay, so we have wild animals, what we know as domesticated animals, animals that would normally, that we're used to, that would normally be meat eaters, and animals that would eat uh, greens. It doesn't matter, they're abiding together. There is no fear between each other. You know, it's going to be lifted, you know, all all this fear, all this dread. And you've got a little child walking with, with the lion, okay, walking around with the carnivorous animals the wild (laughs) lion you know a lot of kids like cats and dogs and and things like that you know they've got them as pets you know in the millennium you're going to go to someone's house and there's going to be a child there and they're going to tell you about the little kitten that they have and you're going to go where's the kitten look in the backyard there's this ferocious lion back there okay well it's not going to be so ferocious but but, you you know people will be able to have pets of wild animals you know and little kids will just be able to to walk around you're not going to have any fear that those wild creatures will, will uh, harm mankind because that's been lifted, okay? So once again, you know, these, these, um, these, these effects of the curse of the flood, of the fear of man, of carnivorous animals eating meat, that's all going to be lifted, that's all going to be removed when Christ rules and reigns for a thousand years, that millennial reign of Christ, that coming of Jesus Christ. And if we can keep going, look at verse number seven. And the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the suckling child, that's a little infant, shall play on the hole of the asp. Now that's a serpent. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. Cockatrice is a a type of snake, as as it were, okay? And so it says, look, little children, babies, infants, are just going to be able to put their hands down the holes and just pull out a snake. There's, There's no fear. They're not going to be bitten, okay? And um, it's, uh, I think about this because I've got a brother down in Sydney, Brother Les. Um, I can't remember which service it was, but there was one church service that he brought some of his pet snakes to church, okay? I can't remember how many there were. The kids were there. They, they loved to hold them, loved to play with them, to pat them. They were, you know, they feel a bit weird. I don't know if you've ever held snakes before. But then we saw some of the adults when they saw the kids playing with snakes, all right, they were like, you know, one, one family just stayed in the car. They didn't want to come, come out, you know, and there was, there was a fear. You know, there was a fear of people with the snakes. Even though these snakes were harmless, you know, they don't, they don't have venom. Uh, they can't kill a man or anything like that. But, you know, just the fear of, of, of man with snakes. Well, little infants, you know, if, if these families that live during this time and have these children, their, their children are just going to be playing with snakes. They're just going to be putting their hands down the hole. It's not going to matter. It's not going to what, what, you know, matter because that, that, the effects of that curse has been lifted in the millennium. Notice verse number 11. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So what's the next thing that we notice in the millennium? It says the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And there's two reasons for that. You know, number one, we have Christ on the earth, okay? I mean, you know, sometimes you go door to door and people say, you know, prove it to me. Prove to me that God exists. Or they might say, you know, if Jesus appeared right now, yeah, then I'll believe him. Well, you know what? Jesus is going to be walking the earth right there and then, okay? People will be able to see Christ, speak to Christ, know who Christ is. And yet it's a sad thing because what we learn is that people will still reject Christ during this time. I mean, people rejected Christ even when he was walking the earth 2,000 years ago. And Christ was doing all kinds of miracles, was casting out devils, healing the sick, the lame, you know, um, raising the dead. I mean, what, what didn't Christ do? And still people didn't believe on him. 
And so in the millennium, you know, yeah, Christ will be there. The knowledge of the Lord will be known throughout the whole world, but there still will be people that reject Him as Savior. And this is why, I don't have time to go through this today, but this is why at the end of the millennium, when Satan is loosened out of the bottomless pit, he's able to uh, gather an army against the Lord. Okay, so there'll still be people rejecting who Christ is and rejecting, you know, His purpose for them on the earth and the Lord will wipe them out once and for all at the end of the millennium. But if you can, um, please now go to 1 Corinthians. Please go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 if you can. And it's not only the fact that Christ is walking the earth that this knowledge of the Lord will be known, but Zechariah chapter 8 verse 22 reads, Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of the host in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take, shall take, hold, out of, um, take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Now, I've already covered this in one of my other sermons. I think it was called the true Jew. And this Jew here is referring to the inward Jew, the one that is a Jew inwardly, the one that has been circumcised in the heart, the one that believes on Jesus Christ. And so because believers are going to be ruling and reigning on the earth, there'll be other saved men on this earth, there'll be great knowledge. And those that don't, do not know the Lord will be seeking that information. You know, they'll be grabbing your garments and say, tell me more about this Jesus that you serve. Tell me, me more about this Jesus in Jerusalem. And we're going to have great opportunities at that point to continue preaching the gospel to the world because there are going to be still people, generations of people being born into the millennium you know, that need to hear the gospel, that still need to place their faith on Christ, even though Christ is reigning on this earth, they need to know about the death, burial, and resurrection. They need to know how Christ offered himself as a sacrifice for their sins. And so, yeah, the knowledge of the Lord will be known throughout the entire world during the millennium. So what did, what did we notice? We noticed that um, the behavior of animals will change and that, you know, carnivorous animals are not going to be eating meat, Okay. But that still doesn't remove the effects of the first curse that God put on Adam and Eve's sin. When the earth was cursed and, and, um, you know, and death came into the world. You know, this does not get lifted until God creates the new heaven and the new earth. Now let me show you this in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 23. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 23, which reads, But every man in his own order, speaking about the rapture, Christ the firstfruits, Afterward, they that are Christ that is coming, then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. So notice that. So once Christ rules for a thousand years, at the end of that, Christ is going to deliver that kingdom to the Father. When does this take place? It says here, when he shall have put down all rule and, and all authority and power. For he must reign till he have put all enemies under his feet. So why does Christ have to rule for a thousand years? Because he's going through a process of putting all his enemies under his feet. Okay, what enemies are you talking about? Well, look at verse 26. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Okay, so when did death come? Well, Romans 5, 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So when did death come into the world once again? When Adam sinned. When God brought a curse, that judgment upon Adam, that he would return back to dust, that he would die physically. Well, that is the last enemy, death. Death is the last enemy of God, and that will be taken care of at the end of the millennium. You know, Christ will put death under subjection. The Bible tells us that death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. Okay? And so once that is taken care of, then Christ can take the kingdom and deliver it up to the Father. And that's when we go into the phase when God the Father will create a new heaven and the new earth. Okay? Now let's understand what this new heaven and new earth are like. If you can go back to Isaiah, it'll be great. Isaiah 65. Once again, why are we reading so much from Isaiah? It's because that's where we get a lot more detail about the millennium, a lot more detail about the new heaven and the new earth. Isaiah 65 and verse 17. Isaiah 65 and verse number 17 reads... For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered, 
nor come into mind. But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing, and her people a joy. And so, once death is taken care of, that final uh, curse that God has brought upon the earth, don't forget that the earth has been cursed, where God has to regenerate or create, as it were, a new earth, a new Jerusalem. We know, if we read the book of Revelation, that new Jerusalem is a, is a heavenly Jerusalem which descends from heaven onto the earth. And it said also in verse number 17 that the former shall not be remembered. Like, we're not going to be thinking about the old earth anymore. Now, this isn't like a memory wipe. It's not like we go to the new heaven, new earth, and now we forgot everything about the past. We forgot what the old earth was like. We forgot that we were sinners in the past. We forgot that Christ died on the, on the earth, you know, 2,000 years ago. It's not that. It's just that we're going to be so interested. We're going to be so excited. What did it say in verse number 17? We're going to be glad and rejoice. We're going to be so excited about the new heaven and the new earth that we're just not going to be able to be spending time thinking about the past. There's so much to look forward to. There's so much to do when God creates this eternal state of the new heavens and new earth that we're just not going to remember. It's not, we're not going to bring it back to remembrance all the problems, all the sins of the past. So it's not a memory wipe. We're not robots and God just forget, makes us wipe our memories. No, it's just we're so overwhelmed by the joy that, you know, of, of living in this new earth, this new heaven, that we're not going to be spending our time thinking about past things. You know? And so there's great joy. You know, it's going to preoccupy preoccupy our lives and our minds, you know, what God has for us. And, you know, the Bible doesn't even say a lot about what it's going to be like. We we get a little bit of a picture. We get some flavor of what it's like. But I think the reason for that, number one, yes, to be a surprise for us. But number two, I don't think we can even comprehend. Even if God tried to write it down for us, it's just going to overwhelm us how great this new heaven and this new earth will be. Um, please go to Isaiah 66 and verse 22. Isaiah 66 and verse number 2. The Bible reads, For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. So for us that are believers, that receive our new resurrected bodies, we're going to remain forever. We're going to live forever with the Lord in the new heavens and the new earth. We're going to be able to see the Father face to face for the first time. That's in the book of Revelation. But let's keep going. Verse number 23. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. So hey, we're going to continue having church in the new heavens and the earth. There'll be an appointed time when we go before the Lord and we go and worship Him. Hey, just like church, you know, when we, out, we have church services open, hey, that's our appointed time to come together and worship God. We're going to continue having church, okay? Verse number 24. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me, for their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. Now, this is the sad part about the eternal state. It's not sad for us because we're in our new resurrected body. You know, we understand the righteousness of God. We understand the, the, the justice of God, the judgment of God. And we understand that those that were Christ rejectors are deserving to suffer in hell or in the lake of fire for all eternity. But I want you to notice that even in the eternal state, that Christ rejectors will be suffering in hell. Christ rejectors are still suffering, tormented in the lake of fire. We're going to be rejoicing in eternity and they will be tormented throughout all eternity. Okay? So think about that. You know, it's, it's so exciting for us to think about our state, you know, that we're going to be with the Lord forever. What a great promises. But then when we think about the lost and their eternal state, you know, being tormented forever in a fire that will not be quenched, you know, they're going to be tormented even into the eternal state. You know, this is why soul winning is so important. This is why preaching the gospel, this is why going to your friends and your, your loved ones that you know are not saved, that you know that they do not know Christ, they're still trying to work their way to heaven, in, you know, with their own righteousness. This is why it's so important for us to go and preach them the gospel. You know, just like we're preaching the gospel in the millennium, hey, we don't have to wait for the millennium. Let's, we do it now. 
You know, and if you've been doing it now, you've been doing the great work of God. You know, we need to be bringing these people into the kingdom of God. You know, letting them experience the, the millennial reign of Christ, experiencing the new heavens and the new earth. Hey, they will be thankful for all eternity that you were the one that came and preached the gospel unto them. Now, in conclusion, brethren, if you can go to Revelation 21. Revelation 21. Just in conclusion, the new heaven and the new earth. Uh, so exciting, so exciting and hard to comprehend. The Bible reads, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. Look at verse 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death. Remember we saw that the last enemy to be destroyed was death. No more death. That curse that was brought into, onto the earth when Adam and Eve sinned, it's gone. Okay? No more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And, and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. You say, can we truly believe that Christ is coming back? Can we truly believe there's a millennium? Can we truly believe there's a new heaven and new earth? What did God say? He says, write these words. He's saying to the Apostle John, write these words, because these words are true and faithful. Okay, this is the truth. There's coming a time when the world as we know it will end. And we're going to enter into this new phase. A physical coming of the kingdom of God. And are you ready for that? And it says these words are true and faithful. Okay, we're not always faithful to God. But God will always be faithful to us. Okay, doesn't matter how much you mess up your life as a believer. You know, you are, you know God is faithful toward you. You are still going to be raptured. You're still going to experience the new resurrected body, rule and reign with Christ. You're still going to enter into the new heavens and the new earth because salvation is eternal. Okay? It's eternal life. And once again, you know, just spare a moment for those that will suffer eternity in the lake of fire. You know, and how important it is for us to do our jobs of getting out there, preaching the gospel. You know? And uh, you know, these two things go together, the eternal state. You know, this is what we should be living for today. I know we live in a temp temporary world. We know, we know we live in a world that will perish. But let's use the opportunities we have now. You know, the work that we do now, we're going to be rewarded by God in the future. You know, and the people that you, you neglect with the gospel, hey, who's going to give them the gospel? Hey, if they're your family, your loved one, do you really want them to go to the lake of fire? Do you really want them to suffer eterni for eternity? Of course not. And you know what? You have the words of eternal life. You know, you, you have salvation at your fingertips, you know, at, at, the, at, the, at the point of your tongue. And God is relying upon you to get out there and do the great works of God. All right, God bless.